right. We did do a mic check. Can you hear me through these speakers? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. <coughs> this is a, it's called a real time mic check right now. So yeah, we're excited to be here. We're going to start off with a short video. I got. I want you guys to see. Take a look. We are born. We are given a world built on the decisions of previous generations. A world created by their choices, some good and some bad. Decisions are constantly made without the knowledge of how they will affect us, our society, and our world. But what if we didn't know the effects? What if we could make choices now that would someday lead to a better world? Every person has a choice. We choose what we buy, what we wear, what we say, and what we do. These choices contribute to an ever-growing swell that drives the course of society, eventually defining an entire generation. But it all starts with one choice from one person. Two generations ago, society began making choices that have shaped today's understanding of pornography. In 1948, Dr. Alfred Kinsey published a best-selling book that suggested that all forms of sexual behavior should be normalized and that people should pursue all sexual urges regardless of age. Businessmen capitalized on this new idea and porn magazines hit the newsstands. Many became convinced that it was cool, harmless, and a gentleman's pursuit. Then, in 1993, came the internet. And like a tidal wave, pornography flooded the world wide web as a generation became consumed. And now, for the first time in history, hardcore pornography can be accessed from anywhere and at any time. So what does this mean for our generation? Through new innovations in brain technology, psychology, and sociology, we now know the truth about pornography. Porn is like a drug. It can rewire the brain, form addictions, alter views about sex, objectify the human body, fuel the demand for sex slavery, and reshape society as a whole. Pornography is often violent and abusive, a degrading lie that distorts the very meaning of healthy relationships and love. We are the first generation in the history of the world to face the issue of pornography to this intensity and scale. We are also the first generation with a science-based understanding of the harm pornography can do. And with that knowledge, we feel the responsibility to share it with others. We are determined to be the generation who pursues real love and rejects its hollow character. We will fight this new drug, and we will not rest until the world knows that pornography is harmful. Yeah, fight the new drug. Awesome ministry and a very powerful video. By the way, guys, so on our slides, you're going to see text your questions. Uh, guys can text questions to me. Ladies can text. Or if you have a question for Kristen, text it to Christian, Kristen, whether you're a guy or a gal. And if you have a question for me, likewise. So if you pull out your phones and you're texting, uh, we're, we're going to assume you're texting us and not your BFF. <laughs> or if you're not checking Facebook or Instagram or anything like that, right? So anyway, let's get started. In our culture, everywhere we look, we see sex. Magazines, movies, billboards, television. It seems manufacturers believe that in order to sell any kind of product, the ad has to be sexual. If we follow these cultural norms, it's easy to see that the world idolizes sex and wants us to idolize sex as well. But why do we idolize sex? So many of us idolize sex without even knowing it. When we find ourselves wrapped up in unhealthy sexual behavior, can't stop feeling lust, looking at pornography. Why is that? Why do we give in and have sex with our partner, with our girlfriend, with our boyfriend? Why do we struggle with same-sex attraction? Why do so many people struggle with this? The cultural influences that I mentioned are a piece to the puzzle and the video that we showed. But there's several other reasons that we could fall into this trap, which are not so obvious. So Kristen and I, we want to share our personal stories with you tonight and unpack how and why sex can become an idol, along with the devastation this idol can cause in our lives. When I was 11 years old, my cousin took me and his younger brother 
into a room and he shared a photo that he found in his dad's bedroom. It was a picture of a naked woman. I remember looking at this for the first time. I had two very distinct reactions. The first reaction was I liked it. I was excited to see this. My heart started beating faster. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins. I thought, this is incredible. The other reaction was, I was ashamed of it. I knew I shouldn't be looking at this, so I kept it a secret. I didn't tell anybody about it. But the next time I went over to my cousin's house, I looked at it again. In fact, I asked if I could go, go to my cousin's for the summer so I can look at it again and again, and I did. He found a bunch of magazines that his dad had hiding. And his dad was doing the same thing in secret. When I was in middle school, the guys that I hung out with teased anyone in our circle who was a virgin. They claimed that they were having sex. Uh, now I understand that they were not. They were lying. But I lied to you. And I said, no, I'm, I'm having sex as well. So 13 years old, middle school, I went from just looking at pornography to seeking out the real thing. By 16 years old, I had sex for the first time. And it was with a girl that I wasn't even dating. 18 years old, I started looking at hardcore pornography, triple X movies. Then when I was 19 years old, I moved to Los Angeles, grew my hair real long, and I joined a heavy metal band. You guys think I'm joking, right? I brought a picture to prove it. A lot of people look at me and they say, no way, it's impossible. He didn't, he, he didn't really do that. Okay, check this out. You ready? There it is. Yeah, that's okay. It, it's, it is funny, the rest of you can laugh now. We usually laugh about this in my family. I know, you're trying to guess which one was me. Any guesses? Right. Huh? The right, the left? Black. Yes, that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a saying back then, it was called sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And that's, uh, that's pretty much how my life was for six years when I lived in Los Angeles, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Damn, that thing is still up there. Let's make that go away. Okay, <laughs> that's better. <laughs> that's what my life looked like for, for six years. When I was 25 years old, I trusted Christ as my personal savior. I met Jesus and it was a real profound experience for me. I knew that I was walking with our Lord and Savior, with our creator of the universe. I had a relationship with him. I also thought that my struggle with pornography was gonna instantaneously, it instantly stop because of this new relationship that I had. And it did for a little while. I was on spiritual high. I was on fire for the Lord, you know. But after a while, started looking at pornography again. But at this point, as a Christian, you know, I'm going to church, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, nobody else is doing this. I must be the only one. I'm the only Christian that looks at pornography. So I kept it a secret. And I just promised myself that I would stop. Shame, regret, fear. I was afraid of what other people would think. So I continued to try and deal with it on my own. I remember reading scripture like Matthew 5.28. It says, Jesus said, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I knew that this meant God wanted me to stop. I believed that I wanted to stop looking at pornography and masturbating, but it seemed impossible. It seemed like I was unable to stop. And I read scripture like 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who believes in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. God wanted that new life so bad. But it, this the scripture just confused me, you know? I was wondering, how could I be a new creation? How, how could my old life be gone? But yet, it really wasn't gone. Why was I continuing to behave this way over and over? I didn't understand this. I felt more shame because of this, like something was terribly wrong with me. So I was confused and broken. I just continued to keep it a secret and tried harder to stop. Along this time, my girlfriend and I, we decided to get married. I had hopes and dreams of raising a family, having children. 
from this pornography use, my sexual sin was not gone from my life. I thought that having sex in marriage would cure the problem, but it didn't. I want to share a little bit of my story with you guys. So when I was 18 years old, I met Jesus for the first time when I was a freshman at Indiana University. And my life totally changed. So much so that when I graduated from college, I really felt like God was calling me into full-time ministry. And so it's really special to be here with you guys because I spent eight years early in my ministry career in, at Las Cruces, in Las Cruces at New Mexico State University. And so there's <laughs> actually like a couple of my <clears throat> dear, wonderful students who are now grown-ups and almost as old as me, <laughs> but um, that are here tonight. So it's really special to be here with you guys. And um, when I moved down here in Las Cruces, I had this longing, like most, I think, young girls grow up with this longing for marriage, for meeting someone special and starting a family. And a couple years into being here, I met a young man named Jorge, and all my friends and family thought that he was a great match for me. He led worship in our local ministry. He led a lot of people to Christ. Um, he was really on fire for the Lord. And so when we, after about a year of knowing each other, when he asked me to marry him, I said yes. And I was thrilled um, to see the new life that God was going to create for us together. So this is a picture of me back in the day. This is on my wedding day. And I had all the hopes and dreams that a young bride has for her life. Um, shortly, though, before we had gotten married, Jorge, I, I could sense that something was wrong. And he, he confessed to me that he had been struggling with pornography. I was shocked. I was very naive, did not. I, I knew that men were visual, men struggled with visual stuff. I just did not understand the whole pornography struggle. And especially for someone who was so close to the Lord. I, I was shocked. I almost broke off the engagement. When I approached my uh, spiritual leader at the time about this issue, he said to me, you know, good luck finding a guy who's never struggled with this, Kristen. The question is whether or not he's going to be honest about it. And because Lord has told you this and you're not even married, that's a really good sign that he wants to deal with this as an issue. And so I think you're good. Well, I was satisfied with the visit. He, he had a visit to a counselor who gave him a video and a book to read. And I thought, okay, well, you know, we're on a good track here. Plus, he's looking at pornography probably part of his struggles because he's being abstinent. Like, we weren't having sex before we got married. So once we're married and can have sex, then pornography's not going to be a problem anymore, right? So we got married. So I want to pick up my story where I left off. When I got married to Teresa, I'd been struggling with sexual sin for 16 years. And I got married thinking that uh, marital sex would cure this pornography addiction that I had. But what I realized was all those years of looking at pornography, I was really programming my brain with two different things. So I had this idea that my wife, like the women in porn, would be ready and willing to have sex anytime. The other one was the picture of sex that I planted in my brain was not that of one person uh, in a married, commi committed married, marital relationship, but it was sex, it was random sex with anyone at any time, with people that I didn't even know, and just for my pleasure. So I brought this thinking into my marriage, and it was a big part of what destroyed the sexuality inside of this marriage. So pornography did not help my marriage in any way. It hurt it in major ways. And I continued to use it. You know, when we first got married, uh, I had not used pornography for maybe the first few months, but then I started looking at it again. I was like an affair waiting to happen, looking at this stuff over and over in secret without my wife knowing about it. And eventually I did cheat on her. So you might think after all of that, this is the point of the story where he's going to get help, right? But not so. You see all those uh, months of dating and a couple of years of marriage, Teresa, she said, I just want you to know one thing. If you ever cheat on me, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm not going to put up with anything like that. 
it made sense to me. By now we had this, this uh, young little baby girl, a daughter, you know, she was just a year old. I was terrified to tell her because I knew that it would mean, it would mean the death of this marriage. It would mean that this little girl would grow up without a daddy in her life most of the time. So I continued to keep it a secret. By this time, I had become totally addicted to pornography and addicted to sex in general. One evening late at night, Teresa caught me looking at porn on the computer. My secret was finally out in the open. She knew. I eventually confessed to the affair, and she did exactly what she said she would do those years. She left. She took our little baby girl, who was about to turn three years old at the time, and she moved out. So I found myself living in this three-bedroom home all by myself. My daughter's going back and forth every other weekend. I, I knew that I was part of what destroyed this family. I found myself in horrible pain. So much so that uh, I started thinking suicide looked like a pretty good option. I was depressed. I didn't make up a suicide plan, but uh, walking out in front of a bus sounded like a pretty good idea. One of the things that stopped me from doing anything like that was picturing this little girl growing up without a daddy in her life, without her daddy, this sweet, innocent little baby girl. So I didn't do it. With all the pain, loneliness, boredom, nobody looking over my shoulder, started back in the same pattern again. Started looking at pornography and keeping it secret. Each time I looked at porn, I prayed and I said, God, would you please just take this away? Take the desire to look at this stuff away. Nothing happened. So I promised God, okay, God, this is going to be the last time. I'm never going to do it again. <clears throat> this will be the last time. Then I started hearing this little voice that said, just look at it one more time. You've looked at it hundreds of times before. Just look one more time. So I did. I said, that's it. I'm never going to do it again. God, this is, this is my, my boundary. I'm never looking at pornography ever again. Then that voice started coming back. Just, just look once more. It's not going to hurt anybody. Just one more time. You've looked hundreds of times. God will forgive you. Okay. I'll look one more time. That's it. This is the last time. Never again. Guess, what's, guess what happened? The voice came back. Just look one more time. Okay. I'll look one more time. But I promise it's the last time. And over and over and over and over again. It was never the last time. It was a lie. This dance just continued. I kept crossing this line. My thoughts started being consumed with God must hate me. You know, he's not answering this prayer. He's not taking this desire away. I started thinking, you know, maybe, 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 um, maybe I'm not really a Christian. Maybe that thing that I did, you know, when I said a prayer and I was baptized, maybe that, maybe I didn't go down deep enough into the water or something happened. <laughs> I just keep doing this over and over again and again. You know, maybe God doesn't even exist. You know, I started getting consumed with these thoughts, and I just kept doing it over and over and over again. So at this point, I was divorced for four years, a single dad, and my porn problem was not going away. So Jorge and I had gotten married, and <clears throat> about two years into the marriage, I could tell something was off, like he was kind of distant, but I wasn't sure what it was, and then one day I found some evidence that something wasn't right, and I confronted him about it, and he confessed that you know, the pornography had continued, and at this point, I was 16 weeks pregnant with our first child, and I was shocked. I was, I was devastated. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I remember like walking, taking walks was one of the only things that could like get me remotely calm. But I, 
I probably look like mentally ill because I'd be walking in the streets around my neighborhood crying and mumbling and talking to myself. I mean, I was just completely undone. It, life as I knew it was wrecked. And I, I didn't know what God was going to do. I was pretty angry with God, quite honestly. And I just, but I, I didn't know where else to go. I cried out to God to save my marriage, to heal my husband. And at this point, I was a lot less naive than I was when I first found out about the pornography. But I still had some magical or over-spiritualizing thinking. Okay, and so we, I thought, you know, this baby is going to change things. And, okay, we're doing this intensive counseling together. So he's, and my love can heal him. I thought all these things. And I was very hopeful that God could save our marriage. In fact, when our son was born, there he is. Isn't he beautiful? We named him Josiah, which means the Lord heals. And I really believe in, in naming him this. That was kind of prophetic that God was going to heal our marriage. But when Josiah was six months old, I found evidence that Jorge was, was still looking at pornography. And that was a line I had drawn in the sand, like, this, this can't keep happening. Because at that point, I knew enough that this thing was progressive, that it wouldn't just stop there, especially because he had already gotten, did I say this when I was pregnant, that he had gotten sexually involved with a student in our ministry? I forgot that. That's a really important part. When, okay, so when I was 16 weeks pregnant, I, didn't, I found out that he had, he, not only was he still looking at porn the whole time, but that it had spiraled to the point where he had gotten sexually involved with a student. That's why... As if pornography alone isn't devastating enough. It is to a wife. But that's why I was beside myself. And I really thought this, I, I, that's why I really thought this marriage, I don't know if it's going to make it. I, I'm probably going to end up being a single mom. Um, so that was a really important point that I forgot to tell you guys. But at that point, when and I, I knew that he had stepped across the line from actually just viewing pornography to getting physical with somebody else, it just threw me for such a loop that at the point when he, when he, I discovered that the porn was continuing, even though he was acting like he was getting better and he was going to meetings and doing all these things that the counselor had told us to do, I knew that, there, that he could not have one foot in the marriage and one foot in this world of porn, that it was only a matter of time before it would spiral into an affair again. So, this is really crazy to talk about this with you guys because, like, well, three of my dear friends who were a part of this recovery process for me are in this room, and I've never done this before in a context where people who were, like, sitting there with me in it um, are here. So, I, my heart is, like, racing because I just am feeling the, the tenderness of that moment, because as horrible and devastating as it was, and as much as I really believe my life was over, I, I look back now and I see the love that I had in my life and the support that I had in my life. I'm not trying to minimize, though, the impact of finding out that my husband was not able to maintain his vows to me. It was, it was super scary that I knew I had to draw a line in the sand and be like, no porn. Like, if that's going to be a part of your life, we can't can't be living in this house. So he left the house and did a lot of things again that looked like he was going to want to recover. Therapy, raising money to go to an, another intensive, working with a Christian counselor. Um, and again, I was really hopeful, but I, at that point I knew, like, hey, if, like my love is not going to save him. He's got to want to change. So when Josiah was about 10 months old, he he called me and said, I've got to tell you this, the counselor won't work with me further until I tell you. And he, he spilled a whole bunch of other stuff that he had done, including hooking up with another woman again. And that was it. That was the final nail in the coffin. My, um, my hopes and dreams of that marriage being saved were gone. And I signed divorce papers. Um, my son was a baby. And we had to move back to Indiana and I thought I'd live in southern New Mexico forever. I loved it. 
and that was my community. And I had incredible friendships and support that still is in my life today. Um, but I moved back to Indiana because I was starting my life as a single mom. I also was told that I would lose my job because I was in full-time ministry. Um, and I was getting divorced, which was like a big fat scarlet letter. And fortunately, I had some men in the organization that I worked for who fought really hard for my job. And I was able to keep my job, but, but there was a lot of shame in that whole experience. And it was so painful. Um, this is a sweet picture. It, it, I'm smiling and happy in this moment because I'm with Luana. Luana's over there. I don't know how many of you guys know her. If, you're, if, you, if you go to her church or you're from Sun City, you might know her. But Luana, and, the, and there's my little Josiah. Um, this is like a week after I moved back to Indiana. She and another friend drove my van back to Indiana so I wouldn't have to drive with my baby. And this is just a week or so after probably a month or a month and a half after I got divorced, and that, that little boy staring at me, his whole world had fallen apart, and so had mine. So after four years of being divorced and still looking at pornography, I decided to, to tell God, okay, I surrender. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do anything you want. Whatever it is that you want me to do, I will do it. Except I'm not going to tell anyone. Just between me and you, God, you can heal this problem. I don't have to tell anybody about it, right? You're the creator of the universe. You created me. You can, you can heal me. You can show me the way out. He didn't answer that prayer either. So along this time, I was in a Bible study. Some of these friends invited me to this weekend experience with God, they called it. They said, if you go to this weekend, it's just a bunch of people, and there's some pastors, and it's, it's a retreat, but God's going to show up. So, I remember thinking, well, I'm pretty sure God still exists, but I don't know where my relationship is with God. I'm, I'm addicted to pornography and sex. I think God hates me. Probably not even a Christian, but okay, I'll go. I'll do it. So I went. Went to this weekend, and God showed up. He just blew holes through all these lies, through some of the people that were teaching that weekend, the lies that, that I believed about myself, that God hated me. He never hated me. You know, the scripture says his love is deeper than the ocean. And it was. So God showed up. I found myself really being able to trust him. For the first time in my life, really being able to trust God. So I finally surrendered unconditionally. And what that looked like was, I said, okay, God, I, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll read whatever you want me to read. I'll go wherever you want me to go. And I'll tell whoever you want me to tell. Really glad you didn't say come down to El Paso, Texas and talk to a bunch of people on a Friday night like this. That, that was not how it started out. But it started out with one person. I started seeing a mentor. This guy had 20 years experience helping people who were addicted to pornography and sex. Some of the things that he started showing me right away was that sexual behavior, it's uh, really a symptom of a deeper heart issue. Just like when we have a fever, you know, we need to see a doctor. We don't know what it is that we have. We have a symptom. We don't treat just a fever with just Tylenol or whatever it is. It could, it could be flu. It could be, you know, one time I had a fever and I went to the doctor. They said, you have pneumonia. Oh, okay. So we don't know how serious the problem is. We go to a doctor. Okay. So we dug into the real issues in my heart that drove the sexual sin. And as a result, for the first time in my life, I experienced total freedom from pornography. February of 2009 was the last time I ever looked at pornography. Over seven years ago. Incredible. So it just stopped. So in 2010, I started feeling safe enough to start talking to other, other guys other men that I knew in my church, 
I started telling them about my struggle and my challenge, and I, I saw that God started creating some safety in these communities, because I would tell guys, you know, my struggle, guys would say, me too. You know, I've, I've struggled for years as well. In fact, I had an affair as well. And I, I just saw that the safety over and over and over again. And I started opening up to more men. And I started realizing, no, I'm not the only one. Actually, statistics today say 68% of Christian men look at pornography at least once a month. 68%. I think it's much higher than that, actually. But 68%. So I started mentoring men. I started helping men. Then I was sitting in church one day. And I was looking around this, this big mega church that we have. In Indianapolis, there was like a thousand people in this church. And I remember thinking about that statistic, 68%. And I'm looking around and I said, God, somebody has to tell these people. Someone has to tell them the truth. Show them what's, that, what's going on inside of them that's causing this behavior. All these, all these years that it was causing this behavior. You know, in my life, I had no idea where it was coming from. I said, God, you have to do something about this. You have to send somebody. And he said, I'm sending you. I said, no, <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> but then I warmed up to the idea after a while, right? God led me into full-time ministry, dealing exclusively with the battle against sexual sin. It's incredible. So this story, after 27 years having an affair with my wife, looking at pornography, after 27 years, now I'm in ministry. Does that sound weird? You know, I'm considered a pastor, okay? But God can redeem our lives. He can take this away. He doesn't take it away in, in an instant. And occasionally he does, but it's usually a process. So he didn't, he didn't stop there either. He blessed me with my wonderful wife, Kristen, and we got married. My daughter, who was about to turn three, I don't know how old she was when, when she we was got nine. married. She was nine years old when we got married. Now I have a stepson, Josiah. And then four and a half years ago, we had a fiery redhead. Aww. We have no idea why she had red hair until we started thinking that we have ancestors on both sides that have red hair. So God completely rearranged my life. He gave me a second chance with this family here. And I gotta tell you, you know, giving my sexuality over to pornography over and over and over again, this dead, lifeless thing, this fantasy that goes away in, in an instant, and then I felt ashamed. Now I get to hit a reset button, take all of my sexuality to my wife. Okay, I'm gonna pick up my story where I left off. I moved back to Indiana. This was 10 and a half years ago with my little baby. And it was a long, painful process of recovery for me. I found a really godly and amazing Christian counselor who was like a second mother to me. And I saw her a lot because I was in a bad place. I, I was not... I would not have objected to the idea of a car hitting me. I mean, I was like, I, it would probably be easier to not have to keep living. But I had this baby. <laughs> and that really motivated me that, and I was just like, I mean, I, I, you guys, if someone would have told me back then, like, God's going to turn this into a ministry for you. This is part of your story, and part of why you're going through this is because you're going to help hundreds and hundreds of other women someday, or you're going to help guys who are entrenched in this and think, oh, this will go away when I get married. You're going to break those, some, bust some of those myths. If somebody would have told me that, I would have been like, what? Because at that point, I just really felt like my life was over, sincerely. And the shame of being a single mom, I was a single mom from 2006 when I divorced until 2010, so for four years, but really lived as a single mom for five years from the last time we separated until Michael and I married. And that was really hard. I don't recommend single parenting if you don't have to do it. Very challenging, a lot of pressure on me. And you guys, I still, even, even though it's been 10 and a half years now since my marriage ended, and, I, and God's blessed me with this incredible new family and a new marriage and a new chance, 
to build something beautiful. I still experience the consequences of Jorge's choices and his um, sexual struggle because my son doesn't have a dad in his life every day. I mean, he sees him for a couple hours every week, but he has not spent one overnight with his dad since he was six months old. And that is painful. That is hard. Um, blending a family, not for the faint of heart. It's totally worth it. I'm so thankful that God is doing this in our lives. But this was not God's original design for there to be such pain and brokenness. I am so thankful that he restores and makes all things new. But, but the consequences of sexual brokenness can be so beyond far-reaching. And um, we're going to share more about the, tr the deeper truths behind why this is such a struggle for us in our next session. But um, I hope that our stories can bring you guys both some sobering truth about how serious this is and, and for us to all take our heads out of the sand. But also some hope that God can make all things new. He can change and make beauty from ashes. He really can. So thank you.